The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. This program was made possible through generous support of the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation to George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate Museum and Gardens. Inaugural Visions, President's Washington to Obama is a co-production of the Fairfax Network and George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate Museum and Gardens. The preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered, perhaps, as deeply as finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution routinely takes place as it has for almost two centuries and few of us stop to think how unique we really are. This every four year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. Let it be said by our children's children that when we were tested we refused to let this journey end. That we did not turn back nor did we falter. And with eyes fixed on the horizon and God's grace upon us we carried forth that great gift of freedom and delivered it safely to future generations. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's gathering. We're going to talk about um, President Obama and George Washington. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. My name is Jennifer Netto. And, um, I do a lot of different things, but I've worked in media for Time Magazine, and I currently do digital strategy for nonprofits and campaigns. And I have some very smart gentlemen on stage with me who are going to discuss some of the amazing tradition we have with the inauguration. Um, here we have Professor Stephen Farnsworth, who is a professor and director at the Center for Leadership and Media Studies at the University of Mary. And we have Peter Henriquez, who is a professor of history from George Mason University. I'll let them um, say a few more words about themselves so you can know their rich expertise. And then we'll dive into some questions to kick things off. And then I'm going to be looking at some tweets and emails from students. Some of you guys gave us great questions in advance. But if you have questions during this discussion, you can use the hashtag GWLeadership to submit them. Uh, I know that you know technology today is something that you know, thrives. And it's not something that's been around forever. But I really ex hope that you guys can join this discussion. And that's really much why I'm here, to make this an interactive multimedia experience. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? OK, uh, well, uh, I want to keep the uh, introduction really brief so that we have lots of time for questions. I teach at the University of Mary Washington. I teach courses in the media and the presidency. And I've written several books that deal particularly with the presidency and the media. I'm really interested in the intersection of politics and news and how news is changing. So uh, those would be the kinds of things that I'd be really interested in uh, talking with you guys about today. And I'm Peter Henriquez. I'm a retired history professor from George Mason. Uh, often speak here at Mount Vernon, uh, and my most recent book is Realistic Visionary, A Portrait of George Washington. Okay, that's great. So why don't we kick things off? I mean, we had a historic election in 2008. We elected the first African-American president, and then we have George Washington, who was the first president ever. So we're really looking at two really powerful events side by side today, and I'm really excited to have you both here. But why are we doing this again this weekend? Why is there a second inauguration? Well, the truth is that in America, there's a lot that divides us as a country, as a people. Um, and if you look at the history of American politics, you see that a lot of these elections have been very close. And a lot of the disagreements, political disagreements, have been really profound on a lot of major issues. And what the inauguration is, I think, above all, is a chance for people to come together and to be Americans together. Just even if it's for a few hours, uh, we are one people for that moment. And uh, even though the second 
uh, inauguration, a second term inauguration, isn't as big, it isn't as dramatic, and it's not going to perhaps be as emotional as a first term inauguration, particularly for Barack Obama. The truth is that it's a moment of reinvigoration. When a president starts a second term, they're looking at new personalities in terms of their cabinet. They're in a very different political position so they can think more about their long-term legacy. They don't have to worry about being reelected, and that can dramatically change the sorts of things they emphasize in their presidencies. Thank you. And why did we have the first inauguration? What did that mean for George Washington? Well, Washington, of course, was unanimously elected president. He's the only uh, person to have done that. Uh, and really, his procession from Mount Vernon up to New York, which was the first capital, was a little bit almost like a royal progress from the king on the way to London. He was feted and greeted and honored and praised uh, all the way from here until he got, uh, got to New York. Uh, and there, under the new Constitution, there was a specific oath uh, that he needed to take, uh, and this was a very exciting beginning of the, of, of the new country, and it was a very dramatic moment. It did have the excitement of, uh, of large crowds trying to get a glimpse of this uh, remarkable American hero to start this experiment uh, in American republicanism. Now, Peter, you said, you know, we talked earlier this week that Washington defined the office, but um, not, but Washington doesn't define the man. I might be muddling your words a little bit, but can you talk about the difference between how George Washington was elected compared to Obama and what that means today? Well, I guess there, there, there are two questions. I mean, you've got to remember at the beginning, uh, this was a very new system. Uh, Washington really gave prestige to the presidency. Today, it's the presidency that gives prestige to Obama or anybody uh, who, holds that, uh, who holds that office. Uh, uh, Washington was, as I said, unanimously elected. They, they came up with this very strange system that we still generally follow, this, uh, the establishment of electoral college, uh, and where the electors were chosen either by popular elections or by the state legislatures. Uh, the Continental Congress said that all the states uh, should pick their electors on uh, the, the 7th of January of 1789. They would get together in February in the different states, not knowing what the other states did, open the ballots. Uh, but there really was no question in anyone's mind that George Washington would be the president, any more than who would be the president of South Africa after the end of apartheid than Nelson Mandela, the man who achieved the end of apartheid without violence. Washington is the unique American hero who had won our freedom. Uh, he has a special appeal to the American people that, frankly, has never been matched and I can't envision ever being matched in the future. Okay. Do you, do you agree with him there? Do you think that the prestige, you know, that Washington brought that to the presidency and now every president seeks it themselves? Or is that, is that still something that, you know, that allure? I mean, I think President Obama has a unique presidency in a lot of ways. Well, of course, every president is, uh, is, is facing a unique set of circumstances and a unique set of challenges. And so it's really hard, those of us who try to study um, the presidency, to really make a lot of comparisons because we don't know how George Washington would have handled the Cold War. We don't know how Abraham Lincoln would have dealt with the, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union. There are so many things that we have to appreciate about the uniqueness of each presidential time in each presidential place. But, there, but if, if you can say that something is more unique, uh, I don't think you should write it in your term papers because a lot of professors would have a problem with that construction, but it's important to appreciate that uh, the situation that Washington faced was the most important of all, because when you look at the Constitution itself, when you read what the founders came up with for the office of the presidency, there was a great deal of gray area that wasn't all that well defined. And so, so much of what the presidency became was when Washington went into the office and defined it by doing it. And so every president since George Washington has been president in many ways in Washington's shadow. And it really is an environment where 
the modern American president is linked to the original American president in a profound way in terms of how one deals with Congress, in terms of how one uh, connects to the public in the society as a whole. And so while the electorates are very different and the political environment is, in, is incredible, uh, incredibly changed from one president to the other, there is this common thread that goes throughout American history, and it is the office that not only was written into the Constitution, but at least as much how it was defined by Washington and his eight years in office. I'd, I'd like to add something to that, Steve, okay. in terms of when you look at the presidency, it's a surprisingly potentially strong office. Uh, the original Constitution as the president can serve an unlimited number of four-year terms. He's commander-in-chief of the Army. He has veto power. Uh, he has uh, significant appointment powers. Uh, he has the ability uh, of pardons and things along that line and a great deal of flexibility in foreign affairs. And you wouldn't expect, since we had been burned uh, by Great Britain and strong executive power, that we would give so much power to this brand new office of the presidency. And the reason they felt comfortable, they were really guarded gained, I guess, more by their hopes than their fears. Washington, they knew, would be the first president. He had not abused power. He had given it up after the end of the American Revolution. So they knew he would shape the office, uh, and they could trust him with power. So actually, Washington does a lot to shape the office of the presidency even before he becomes president of the United States. And then, of course, as president, uh, makes so many key decisions uh, that future presidents have followed in his footsteps. Well, I think that's a great primer for, you know, what we're about to witness this weekend. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, and this is from an email from someone from Bricks Township in New Jersey who decided to send us this question. Uh, what are the main differences between the first inaugural address of George Washington and the second address that President Obama will be delivering this weekend? Well, to me, the main difference is the reach. Um, when you think about the modern media, the modern media environment, and the ability of any president to reach not only the people across this wide country but across the world, you really have a moment where everyone is paying attention. This is a an extraordinarily big event compared to the media of George Washington's time. I mean, when you talk about you mean how they didn't have Facebook and Twitter to talk about mm -hmm. it then. Yeah, there wasn't any sort of hashtag for um, inauguration number one, um, and that reality is that um, is is really I think an important part of the role that the presidency has today because it, you know I think that in many ways presidents are. A national fathers, not unlike George Washington, but their ability to reach ordinary Americans and to be the center of the national conversation about where the country is going, where the society needs to go. It's really extraordinary. I mean, the big difference to me is this media uh, environment where you can go anywhere in the world and at any time you can find all the information that you need online and that gives us the opportunity to watch some of the old presidents the presidential inaugural addresses from before we were born um, but it, it also gives us the opportunity um, to see and connect and interact of course because of course the big issue uh, trending on Twitter this weekend is going to be inauguration number two for Barack Obama and uh, George Washington didn't get that that kind of attention he had a lot of respect but he didn't have a hashtag that's true, but I, I, you know, I like to say, you know, Paul Revere was maybe the first tweeter. You know, he ran around saying the British are coming, which is, a, you know, fits into 140 characters. Um, and you know, I think of how technology has changed and how it's evolved, and really the way we communicate today is in, you know, brief, memorable statements. And I think that from the telegram to, you know, to Twitter, we can see that there is still some consistency in terms of the power of communication and the power of you know, the president being able to talk to people um, either at a one-to-one -one level or on a stage. And wa Washington's uh, inaugural address uh, was heard probably, those of you in the back of the room would not be able to hear it. Washington was not much of a public speaker. Uh, he was fairly nervous uh, in, in, in presenting public oratory. Uh, and uh, his speech was carefully crafted. James Madison helped 
write it. Believe it or not, one of his early aides wrote a 73-page inaugural address, uh, which fortunately Washington talked to Madison and they changed it down to about four pages uh, and uh, had some very significant uh, quotes in it. But uh, the, the main thing was not so much what Washington said, but the fact that he took the oath of office uh, and began this uh, new experiment as president. That was really the key event. Uh, and once he was finished taking the oath, uh, just in terms of a slight controversy, Washington, unlike when Obama finishes his oath, he will add extra words to what the Constitution says. Uh, Obama will say, so help me God. Uh, myth to the contrary, Washington did not uh, say that at the end of his uh, inaugural address. He followed just what was in the Constitution. Okay, I mean, just remember, you can't, you can't type out 73 pages. No one had laptops back <laughs> then. So that sounds like quite a lot of editing work um, for anyone who's had to edit a paper or write something quite long. I'm gonna take the next question from Twitter. Um, Peace Love Bubs, I might be saying that wrong, um, asks us, how would Obama's agenda be different if he had as little media coverage as George Washington? Uh, I think that's a really interesting question, having worked in the media myself and realizing the power of that platform. Uh, you know, what did he have to care what the press thought or, you know, I mean, what do you think? Would, would President Obama have a different agenda today? Well, it's really hard to imagine, I think, the political environment, those of us who've come up with the media as in its current form or have seen it develop in recent years, to imagine how different it was because in many ways the historical reality of, of the American political system involved a much more isolated lawmaking than we see today. Not only do we have presidents not being able to command the national discourse the same way, um, you had fewer people listening and government was much smaller. This was also um, affecting members of Congress. And so I think that one of the big things that the early presidents had to deal with that modern presidents may not be as particularly as good at is just negotiating with these individual people who are somewhat removed from their constituencies. They did not face the immediate wrath of the National Rifle Association if they talk about changing gun control laws. And so the situation that in, in many ways you may think of as a presidential advantage, the presence of this ubiquitous mass media that allows the president to be on CNN and C-SPAN and Facebook and, and Twitter all the time, uh, is a great advantage for a president. It's also a great disadvantage because it's much harder to move members of Congress when everybody is watching members of Congress really closely. And so you really do have a very difficult modern environment when you think about uh, trying to legislate. Um, I tend to think that probably what you would see would be a mo an even more aggressive agenda from Obama in, without this kind of media in response to the question because you wouldn't have to worry as much about the, the, the destructive uh, efforts at, against the president's agenda by very well-organized, well-mediated voices. You wouldn't have to worry about the very close, up to the second monitoring of individual lawmakers who are much more worried about primary opponents and interest groups working against them than they are interested in working with the president, particularly across party lines. And so I think that uh, that environment might be um, constraining to a president, not necessarily ennobling right. or expanding yeah, I mean, with media. If you, if you yeah. think of the, the difference in terms of the age when you think of now, remember Washington is unanimously elected by, I come back to that point because he owes nothing to anyone. Uh, he's universally beloved as he comes into the office. Today we have a situation where we've got unembarrassed partisanship, we have embedded lobbyists, uh, we have a media circus, uh, we have this kind of constant uh, barrage and tension, uh, and that's a very different uh, atmosphere in, in, to, uh, to operate on. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know who saw Lincoln in the room. Did anyone see it? They seem like they had some pretty fierce discussions, uh, you know, in Congress back in the day. So are you trying to say that, you know, yes, Congress is more partisan, but in some ways they might be more scripted? I mean, it seems like without the media attention, you may have been able to be more forthright. Oh, no, there's no question partisan. I mean, if you look at the 1790s, although not right when 
when Washington's inaugurated, but partisanship is a major issue. The division between uh, Hamilton and Jefferson, the Republican and Federalist parties, every bit as bitter as Tea Party views of Obama today. There's a great deal of, uh, of, of friction. Uh, so it, it, uh, it is not that, but it, but it is a different uh, atmosphere. And really, Washington's approach is almost really a pre-democratic approach to the presidency. His view of a republic is that the leader stays above partisan bickering, short-term Gallup poll types of things, and does what is in the best interest of the country. But really, in, our, in this modern age, uh, Washington's approach, to be honest with you, probably would not be successful, and uh, he wouldn't be elected. And to be honest with you, he wouldn't run uh, in this kind of wow. system. Well, that's something to think about as we're up here today at Mount Vernon. Um, the next question we have comes from Bailey Bishop Two on Twitter, and he has to say, "Why does the president have to be reinaugurated when they're elected for a second term? Why do we do it twice?" Well. For me, I think the biggest thing is the point that I made before about how people really need to come together, um, at least briefly, because we don't have a lot of institutions that bring us together as a people. Most of politics is about driving people apart. Which team are you on? Which side are you on? How do you feel about this issue? Um, who is donating to your campaigns? And, and those sorts of things. But also, presidents who have been reelected, and now they know, of course, they can never run again, they often have a very different agenda in a second term than a first term. I think that one of the big things that, um, that explains the emphasis on gun control that you've seen in recent weeks from the Obama administration is very clearly the, the tragedy in Connecticut, but also the practical political reality that he does not have to face the voters again, and, and he doesn't have to worry as much about making enemies as he might the first time. And so in many ways, I think a second term allows for this uh, vision, the original vision of Washington's first term, where you are uh, sort of above politics, at least uh, to an extent. I mean, no president can ever be truly above politics. They have to convince members of Congress who are very political to go along with them if they're going to get very far. But the reality is they think much more about the legacy. They think much more about the long-term interests of how they want to be remembered and what they want to do. And that can really create a very different agenda. And so I do think it's really important to hear a second term inaugural address. They're, they're, most of them are not very famous, of course. Most presidents uh, give a better first term address than a second term. But the truth of the matter is that there is often a redirection. And it's important for us all to know exactly what shape that new administration is going to take in a second term. And, and the inauguration, I mean, you, you're, you're elected for a set period of time under the Constitution. So if you're elected a second time, you need to renew your oath under the Constitution to uh, continue it. Uh, Washington didn't really think, talk about second term inaugural addresses. Uh, I'm sure this is one record Obama will not beat. Washington's second inaugural address was 135 words law. Uh, it was just pew, done. Here we are, done, let's move on. Uh, uh, so he did not, but he certainly saw the need to, to renew his oath under the, under the Constitution. I think that would fit in a Facebook update. What do you guys think? <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask, though, is, you know, you said this point about tradition, and I, I really, I believe that, too. I mean, we came through such a bitter year of a campaign, and there were so many doubts cast on the president, even during his first term. You know, the whole birth certificate situation was fairly ridiculous from my point of view. Um, you know, it seems like this president, even more than others, has to reaffirm his credibility over and over again. Um, so what are some of the traditions that he'll be, you know, proceeding with? And this is based on a question from Twitter as well, from Sophia Crutch. Um, what, how has the ceremonial aspect of the inauguration evolved and or stayed the same over time? I don't know if, who wants to start. <laughs> well, the first of uh, Washington was not uh, clear. I mean, he came from uh, down, down the road within a carriage protected by military people, came into where the Senate and the House, it's where on Wall Street, the old federal building, you can see where Washington was inaugurated. They had to scurry around to find a Bible for him to, uh, to, to take the oath upon. Uh, and uh, then it was delivered on a balcony uh, in front of a large crowd that couldn't hear anything, but they could see their hero. 
Uh, the ceremony itself was very brief because the constitutional uh, oath is very brief and written right into the Constitution. Uh, and then uh, when it was done and the Chancellor Livingston indicated that he was had taken the oath, everyone screamed, long live our great president, and cheered, and, and they had fireworks that night. Uh, they did go to church services at the end. Uh, Washington did not uh, say, so help me God, but he kissed the Bible uh, at the end of, uh, of taking the oath, a little bit like uh, kings might do in terms of affirming his seriousness towards this, uh, towards this mission. And then all the Congress and the president went to St. Paul's Church for ceremonies at the, uh, at the end of uh, the inauguration. But there were fireworks and partying that night. Uh, with the streets were so crowded, Washington couldn't get home in his carriage. He had to just get out of the carriage and, and, and walk home through the crowds to uh, get where he wanted to. That to sounds go. about how I had to get out of the last inauguration myself. <laughs> the carriage just wouldn't take me home. <laughs> um, I also wanted to say, you know, mention a lot about religion and the tradition there. And, you know, has any of that waned in the past, you know, couple centuries? <laughs> well, I, I think that um, most uh, presidents are very inclined to try to connect with the public as much as they can. I think that we have a kind of a paradox, if you will, when we think about the American presidency. On the one hand, we want somebody who's really competent and really effective and, you know, really, really intelligent and capable. But at the same time, we don't want somebody who doesn't understand the lives of ordinary Americans, who isn't sort of like us. And so it's a very difficult needle for a politician to thread to be both the object of adulation, but also the object of being an ordinary neighbor community person who would understand how they lived. And I think this was one of the challenges that both Mitt Romney and Barack Obama had in this election cycle, was to try to present themselves as sufficiently connected to ordinary Americans and ordinary American lives so that people could feel that their president could understand them. And so this is an important part of the role that religion can play in the way that presidents talk about themselves and they talk about their situations and how they connect with people. Uh, America from the start has been a religious country, but it hasn't had an organized religion controlling the government. And that's a huge difference from countries of the 18th century and the extent to which the uh, secular authorities were connected to the religious authorities of a given society. The, the, the only uh, real emphasis on religion in the Constitution is the specific statement that no religious uh, oath will ever be declared of anyone running for president. Obviously, if you ran for president in the United States and said, I'm an atheist and I want to be president, you would not get elected. But there's in the Constitution, uh, there, is, uh, there is this clear statement uh, that no, uh, no religious preference will be taken. They've, they've seen some of the dangers of that religious persecution that caused over the years. But Washington certainly is religious. If you read his first inaugural address, a lot of it is asking for the great uh, builder of the universe to bless the American experiment as he has in the past and carry on in the uh, and carry on in the future. And of course, if you think about how big the office has become and how much is expected of a modern president and how great the challenges and the risks and the pressures that they face, you can certainly understand why a lot of people would find it really important to try to hope that there's a higher power out there that can help them because this is an immense job, an immense challenge. Uh, even in the best of times, it's very, very hard. And as you say that it was, you know, it is very hard still today and there's new challenges. Um, what would you say George Washington would have done with today's, you know, media and today's politics? I mean, like you said, you didn't think he would run. You didn't think he'd be elected, but it seems like those qualities that you need in a president have changed over time. Yeah, uh, count, counterfactual. It's, uh, my challenge is to try to figure out what Washington did. Uh, <laughs> the challenge of what he would do is almost impossible. Uh, and really, Washington's prescription was how to make America a great nation, which it was not when he was president. Not how should we act when we are a great nation. So uh, Washington has a different. Uh, uh, really a different approach in terms of what his what he viewed as his uh, his responsibilities uh, along along that line I don't know if I answered your question 
if no, not answered fine. I mean, again. I, I think the nation has changed uh, so much. You know, yeah. it's it's grown. Right. There's more people. There's a larger, right. you know, diversity. Washington, you know, he's 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 not an ordinary man, and he's not striving to be an ordinary man. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, Jimmy Carter said, I want to be as good as the American people. Uh, well, Washington wanted to be a damn sight better <laughs> than the American people. Uh, because uh, if, if he were not, we would be in trouble. And I think that's probably, probably true. But Washington comes from, from a, different, a different age where there is a certain elitism, where people are viewed, some people are superior and ready to rule. Uh, and now you have to connect. If you can't connect with the American people, uh, I mean, one of the things that Mitt Romney uh, ran into trouble at, with was trying that he doesn't understand the 47% of the American people, and that was, uh, that was a, uh, a real blow to his, uh, to his campaign. Uh, but Washington's view basically is power comes from the people. You know, there's the wonderful Lincoln quote, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Washington believes in government of the people, for the people, but he wouldn't believe in by the people. Okay. You know, it's, it's really hard to think about, but, you know, President Obama couldn't have even run for office when George Washington was elected. Um, so, you know, in terms of power of the office now, what do you think he can do in the next four years that will continue his legacy? Well, I think that a lot is going to depend, as the fortunes of his first term depended, on the state of the economy. I think that ultimately it's much easier for a president who is seen as successful to be persuading, to be persuadable not only to the public but also to those members of the other party that might be persuadable. And so you, you need a situation where there is a measure of very clear success to maximize your effectiveness. I think that, uh, that the second term uh, normally for most presidents isn't as successful as the first term because almost immediately people are already talking about who's going to run in the next presidential election. You've already seen a few candidates make the, uh, the pilgrimage to New Hampshire and to Iowa thinking about 2016. And so presidents have a very narrow window in a second term because people almost immediately are thinking, okay, am I going to be on the, uh, the Hillary Clinton team or the Joe Biden team or some other situation? And so um, Obama, what Obama needs to maximize his effectiveness in a second term is a, um, is a pretty rapid economic recovery because even if there is an economic re recovery, if it's occurring in year six or year seven, um, there's going to be very little uh, success that he can, uh, can, uh, can secure. When we look at the modern uh, partisan divisions in this country, it's very hard for presidents to get much support from the other party. And when the other party controls one chamber of Congress, as of course is the case right now, it's very difficult to get um, all that far. And you can see that when you look at the recent fights over the fiscal cliff and sequester, that the most Congress can agree to do is give themselves a postponement. I mean, in, in many ways, you know, when they talked about, you know, Congress waiting until the last minute like students, I think that insults students. <laughs> no student gets the kind of extensions that members of Congress give themselves. That's true. So we have about five more minutes before we're going to bring our student panelists on board. And I was kind of scrolling through the tweets, and there's been a lot of questions about the Second Amendment, which I think is, you know, something to think about at this time, because when it was written, it seemed, you know, relevant in a completely different way than today. So, you know, if you can tell me what, you know, you think George Washington felt about the Second Amendment then, and, you know, we can talk about maybe Barack Obama's changes, and then we'll wrap this up and move on to the video. Well, if you, if, if you go online, you'll find that Second Amendment people will be <laughs> quoting Washington uh, in terms of support of the Second Amendment, but actually they often uh, add quotes that he did not say. Uh, and, and Washington never said uh, that people need to be armed to protect themselves from the government. And actually, really, the underlying thrust, in my own opinion, of the concern for the Second Amendment and the need for uh, automatic weapons and things like that is because among many people, there is a fear that the government is them versus us. Uh, not representing us, but they're a threat to us. So we need our guns in order to protect 
against a government uh, that threatens our freedom. Uh, Washington would not see it that way. Uh, Washington saw the government as the representative of the people uh, and the, he certainly believed in the right to bear arms, as uh, that's, a, that, that's clear. But the idea that the government is the enemy of the potential enemy of the people uh, is something that Washington never, uh, never said, and those who quote him to that effect simply are not accurate. Okay, that's very interesting. We have about two more minutes. Did you want to weigh in? Well, I think that one of the things to remember is that the Constitution is a work in progress. And when we look just at the words of that document, we see a lot of opportunity for interpretation, whether you're a liberal or a conservative, whether you're a strict constructionist or you believe in an evolving Constitution, um, you can find something to justify your point of view. Um, and one of the important things to remember is that things in the political environment, even with respect to laws like the amendments in the Bill of Rights, they are not absolute with respect to uh, existing on their own. If you think of the First Amendment and the right to free speech, there are certain things that you can't say. You can't encourage people to, um, although probably the crowd at Mount Vernon isn't uh, likely to do so, uh, I couldn't encourage you to go out and burn down Mount Vernon across the, uh, across the way here. Um, the truth is that these kinds of incitements to violence are not protected by the First Amendment. And so even though there is a free speech amendment, there are ideas about manner and place and timing that can be uh, instituted as, as controls, as regulations. And so um, we're still working through this kind of calculation of what's constitutional and what's not with respect to guns because, you know, George Washington and the founders didn't really think about assault weapons when they were thinking about the, uh, the Second Amendment. They didn't really consider the situations like Connecticut. And so one of the things that is really extraordinary about our political system is the ability to work through these questions in light of new evidence, in light of new information. We can amend the Constitution, we can pass laws, we can interpret laws differently depending on circumstances. That's not to say that we need to quote unquote gut the Second Amendment, but it is to say that we need to think about how we balance these competing rights because people have a right to be safe as well as they have a right to have a gun. And so we have to come to terms with what is a valuable middle ground for, uh, for the public and for the government. And our system allows us to, uh, to work through these issues in a peaceful manner. And that separates us from plenty of other places. Okay. Well, I think we've seen how technology has changed not only when it comes to the internet, but also when it comes to to weapons and everything else, you know, there's pros and cons to it all. Uh, we're going to move on to the video and then have our student leaders join us on stage. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. If you were being inaugurated on Monday, what would be the theme of your inaugural speech? Unity, because the American politics right now isn't unified. We're not thinking of Americans. We're not thinking of each other as Americans. We're thinking each other as two different parties, we're thinking of each other as you know, black, white, but we're not thinking as Americans as we should be. And that's causing a lot of problems for ourselves. And frankly, if it, in the next foreseeable future, it's going to be a huge problem because we're not unified. We're not divided. My speech will be about national security because I feel like America does not feel safe as a country because of the Sandy Hook incident, and before that, the movie theater incident, and before that, 9-11. And I feel like it hurt this country as a whole and I feel like we don't think that we're as secure as we were and I know that people have come up with like anti-gun laws to try to alleviate that but I don't think as, as a citizen I don't think that that would do anything I think we need something bigger than that the theme of my speech if I were to give one at an inauguration would be inspiration it'd be to inspire the people of our country America and to bring us more unified as one country that way we can get rid of all these problems that we're having in debates so we can have one answer and not keep debating over if we should have gun control laws or not or if we should have birth control pills or not. And For America, I think it would mean bringing us together as a country and getting rid of the separation that we have with two parties and just being unified as one country. It would be equality because um, with all of the issues with um, 
women versus men in the workforce and um, you know of course the gay rights and so on and so forth I feel like America is trying to unify everybody and I feel like that's what we need to focus on because we can't push forward we're trying to pass things and it's difficult because there's two really big conflicting opinions and I feel like we just need to all come together so that we can get all these problems out in these next four years and become a better country. If I was being inaugurated on Monday as President of the United States, my theme would be patience and I would ask that the American people assist me in my tenure as President because one man alone cannot fix all the problems that this country has faced. I would do everything in my power to make sure that the President elected after me will succeed in fixing all our economic problems, our env environmental problems, and our educational problems. Okay, and we're back with our student panelists. Um, I have Chris Shepard, and I have Abrar Omish, and I have Brooke Peterson. Thank you so much for joining us. We've looked backwards, forwards, and now I think we're gonna go straight to the future. <laughs> so um, why don't you guys just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, just maybe what you're studying and why you're joining us today. Hi everybody, it's good to be here. My name's Chris Shepard. I'm a freshman at St. John's University in Queens, New York, and I'm studying political science and public policy. Hi everybody, my name is Abrar Omish. Uh, I'm a senior at Robinson Secondary. I'm pursuing the IB Diploma and uh, I hope to go to Georgetown School of Foreign Service next year. Hi, my name is Brooke Peterson. Um, I'm a senior at Centerville High School and um, just kind of up here because my growth and development and my interest in government. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, before we kick things off, it sounds like we have a question in the audience. Is that still relevant? Okay, Hello. there we go. Um, Hi. Okay, so I have a question. I know you guys already talked about media, but um, I know now that presidency is more known and visible, but I was wondering, is it a positive or negative thing? Because I know it can be positive because um, we get to like, see the president and everyone around the world and everyone nationwide, like worldwide, can see the president. But is it a negative thing? Because we don't get as much depth because everything is in two-second segments and it's, it's 140 characters and it's not, we, we're not getting to really meet the president. We are meeting this facade that he makes up to like, present to the media. Like, it's not like he's presenting to us anymore, it's like he's presenting to the media. Is that, so is media well, a positive or negative thing? Sure, why don't we do a quick yes or no. Is, has the media made the presidency um, better or worse? What do you think? We'll start, um, we'll start with our professors here, just if you wanna say yes, no, worse, better, whichever you like, and we'll go to the students. But uh, worse. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would say worse too because of the uh, uh, the pressure of, of, of public opinion uh, and the constant scrutiny uh, under the press doesn't allow for some of the creative leadership that you might have. You know, when the Constitution, when they were meeting to write up the Constitution, they agreed to have it in secrecy uh, because if they didn't, if the media were noticing everything that were done, people wouldn't be able to change their mind. Uh, and I think Washington would have would have been annoyed uh, significantly if okay. he had to operate under current circumstances. Okay, I mean, you know, I may have picked the wrong profession here, but uh, <laughs> what about you guys, worse or better? I'd say worse, but there are definitely some, some good aspects to, you know, the more exposure to media. I mean, it allows him to get his message across to more people. Um, right now, this is a national broadcast, and so it's just an example of how many people you can speak to and, you know, uh, reach out to and, and provide your message to. So it's, I think, worse overall, but there's some good aspects, too. I think both. Um, I, I would definitely argue for both, but unfortunately, more worse, and I can talk about that <laughs> if you're going to ask us to elaborate. Yeah, I think that's, it's a tough question because they're, like we've said, there's pros and cons to both, but... At the end of the day, it, changed, it has changed the presidency from the beginning, and I think that's kind of how its downfalls. Okay, and just to put this out there, if you guys have a question, um, raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone, or if you don't want to do that, you can certainly still tweet your question uh, to GW Leadership, and we'll try and queue it up. We can't get to everything, so I'll do my best. Um, you know, you guys said something interesting, you know, in terms of the media making it better or worse. I mean, it's, it's gonna be sort of a fact of life as we mm -hmm. move ahead, and what I find so interesting about your response is 
the trust that you place um, either in the government, in media, or in technology. You know, I've worked in the digital space for a long time, and what I find really interesting is the trust that we place in our friends. And what our friends or our parents tell us online or at the living room or in the dining room, we're more likely to trust. So I kind of like to ask you guys, I mean, who do you trust more? Do you trust the government? Do you trust your family? And why? You know, where do you place that in terms of decision making and how this would affect, you know, this next term? Well, I think it depends. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about a very complicated issue like, um, you know, Iran trying to, um, you know, uh, get nuclear weapons, I, I definitely wouldn't trust my my 22-year-old brother, you know, I, I wouldn't <laughs> trust him on something like that. But I, I think that it, it goes both ways. There are some, um, I think, media outlets that, you know, have a better track record for being trustworthy and honest. And so, uh, you know, I watch a lot of, um, you know, C-SPAN and things that are, you know, not necessarily biased. And so when it comes to complicated issues like that, you know, for our nation and for our people, I go to, you know, sources like that, the Mount Vernon, you know, um, so, yeah. That's great. I think it's, it's a challenge in two different ways. The first being so much media out there, it's what do you choose, what do you know is uh, trustworthy. So I think a diversity of, uh, a variety of sources is really important. They teach us that in school. I know that, I mean, recently, Madam Secretary Hillary Clinton said that Al Jazeera is one of the most credible sources. So just trying to get a diverse, um, a variation of the sources that you are seeing, especially on a biased topic, you know, trying to look at different points of view. But the other problem that media poses is that because of people's reliance on it for the message and everything, it puts a lot of pressure on politicians and on people who are supposed to speak to us uh, from a genuine perspective in terms of accountability, in terms of should I say this to please the voters so I can win again, or am I going to say this so that, um, which is the truth of the situation? Um, so that's where it's become a challenge, I think, trusting the media source and how they're interpreting the issue, and trusting the people who are speaking through the media anyway. Okay. So, Brooke? I think you trust what you know. Um, my family, definitely the way you're raised, how you're influenced, that's, it's how you've been grown, that's what you trust in. and I. I think it changes over time as you develop your own views and your own de like decisions. And but also, like what we were talking about before with the government, with the media, as we spoke about, you can things can be misquoted. Like they can be taken through different perspectives, and that's where trust issue comes into play. You you can't always believe what you read as they tell you. Not everything on the internet is true, and that's how we're told most of our information from the government now is through internet, through the media, and it's become a challenge to trust them through those issues. The other problem is the ease with which one person can have so much influence. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, my, my family has been personally affected by this in so many regards in terms of what people can post and then what people read and what people truly believe, which can be some lunatic writing about whatever they feel that has mm -hmm. no credibility whatsoever. So we still need the fourth estate in some ways to balance all those one, <laughs> people out there. One but. of the challenges, <laughs> too, is the more extreme voices are the voices. If you want to get on television, yeah. you take a more extreme position and you may get a hearing. Uh, if you're thoughtful middle of the road, it's much harder to do. It doesn't sell, uh, it doesn't sell as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. certainly, as would-be historians or leaders, uh, if nothing else, be skeptical. Uh, you know, as you listened to Lance Armstrong a few months ago, uh, be skeptical. Uh, and uh, you do, uh, you know, that's just a good rule of thumb uh, in terms of assessing information because uh, uh, people can sound pretty persuasive uh, until you examine the story in a little more detail. Sure. And if I can raise one more thing. Sure. Um, <laughs> I wanted to get to one more question, so go okay. ahead. Okay. The media is biased towards equality often, because, or towards a um, balanced perspective, perspective, although sometimes it's a clear-cut issue. You know, we're facing that with gun control, just briefly to mention. Um, a lot of people say the American populace is against guns, while, you know, we have, it, in the media, we see it as a balanced issue, something that the country's divided on, things like that. So I think because people are realizing that the media can be biased, there's also now becoming the problem of bias towards equality when an issue might be very clear cut. So. Okay. 
Um, really a quick poll. If you heard from President Obama on Facebook, would you trust him more than if you saw him on CNN or if you saw or less? For those who would trust him more on Facebook, raise your hand. And if you saw him on CNN, would you trust him more? Okay, so interesting. I'm just curious about the, the messaging and the medium here. Um, I know we have another question in the audience, so I just want to hear from yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm from uh, Woodson High School right here in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, <laughs> President Obama said in his 2009 inauguration address that we the people have remained faithful to the ideas of our forebears and true to the founding documents. How much does this apply, like when you guys were talking about gun control and how the, uh, the Constitution can be interpreted, how much does the, that quote right there apply to today and how we do things in our government today? Well, I, I would, if I could start on this one, I would, I would say that it's, it's, it's an evolutionary process. What the Constitution means, what we understand our political system to be about. Um, once upon a time, we had slavery. Once upon a time, we had uh, senators who were elected by state legislatures rather than voters. I mean, we have a process here that is evolutionary not revolutionary and that's that's an important thing to appreciate as we go through these years and so in many ways the constitution is a road map more than a destination i think and and so it gives us a, a place to go a vision of who we might be as a people and um, we're not there yet we haven't we weren't there in 1865 we weren't there in 1805 I would argue we're not there yet because there's still a lot of things to work through in terms of figuring out how to make a society that more people can feel um, happy about that more people can feel more satisfied with the uh, and maybe that's an impossible task uh, Washington was the only one with the uh, the perfect score in the Electoral College and <laughs> that's not going to change anytime soon I think but um, but to the extent that we can you know reduce the frustrations and anger that so many people feel uh, in our political system we should think about how uh, how we can do that um, and that would be a, a challenge for uh, for us a challenge for you and a challenge going forward I mean much of the Constitution is deliberately ambiguous because when you're seeking to get approval if you fudge things we can all say who wants a healthy and happy America we all agree but if we start to say well what about taking away assault weapons then you begin to break down uh, the Constitution's deliberately vague uh, and Washington as president uh, there was a major issue should he sign a bank bill uh, and Thomas Jefferson wrote a wonderfully eloquent statement it doesn't say in the Constitution we can do it if we do it, we open up a Pandora's box and then the government will be able to do anything. Alexander Hamilton picked up his pen and said there are implied powers within the Constitution to promote the general welfare and a bank is one of them. Washington took the broad interpretation of the Constitution, signed the bank bill. Uh, I think if he had not done that, whatever the Tea Party uh, position is, if you take a stultifyingly narrow view of the Constitution, uh, you simply, it can't work from 1787, 88 until uh, 2013. There has to be a certain amount of flexibility, and that's one reason why we have our executive branch and our judicial branch to interpret what was within the broad limits of the Constitution. Constitution is crucial but it's not an absolute straitjacket because it often doesn't tell you uh, what to do uh, about assault weapons or pornography or child labor or things along that line. It's just not in there. So it sounds like you guys have a lot of work to do in terms of reinventing the Constitution over the next, I don't know, 100 years. Um, you know, we have only a couple minutes left and I really wanted to hear from this panel you know, what is your hope for the second term? You know, that's why we're here today, to celebrate the inauguration and talk about it. And I know I've learned a lot, so I hope you guys have too. Um, you know, Brooke, maybe you can tell us in a few words, like, what you hope this second term will mean for Obama or for yourself and your generation. Well, I think the main thing I always think about is common ground. we have It's been a recent issue in our Congress, and it's come up in discussions a lot lately, and just how we need to come back, we need to collect, and almost need to go back to the way George Washington did it, where he wanted this peaceful transition of power, and it just it needs to fall back as we are one nation, and this is our president, and this is what we are set for for the next four years. 
I completely agree. I think that there are um, three main things that we need to look at going moving forward. Number one is minimizing partisanship. I think everyone can agree on that one. Um, I mean, the congressional approval rating is 14 to 17 percent. We're talking about a government by the people. What, what, <laughs> there's clearly a problem there. And the other thing is, um, in terms of reviving, uh, reviving a morality in the people, I think when Washington uh, gave his speech, he referred to God a lot and everything. And I'm not saying it necessarily has to be religious. We are very se you know, secular and we protect the rights of um, people who choose to fa have faith and people who choose not to. But I think that is part of this issue with accountability, the, part, uh, the issue with bias in the media, all of that. Really having morality um, in, in each individual in terms of how they lead their life. And that way they'll only care about the cause, serving the people the way it's supposed to happen, and not how they come out in terms of the public eye. So more public um, servants. <laughs> no, seriously. And the, yeah. last, the last point mm -hmm. is bringing back the idea that the United States is a land of opportunity, and bringing back the meritocracy that's evolved with that. I mean, prices in terms of college and everything, we're facing that. Uh, things like health care, things that are basic rights that everybody should have, uh, that the president has done a great job on, to continue moving towards those types of things. So everyone has a true equal opportunity in this country. So, that's okay. I think Brooke and Abra both made great points, and I'd like to just piggyback off what they said about bipartisanship. Um, you know, nowadays our politics has become so polarized and divisive. And going forward, you know, not just in the next four years, but by the time, you know, we're making our contribution <laughs> to help people, I'd like to see a government more together. And I think a, a good quote for this um, was in Barack Obama's first inaugural speech. And he says, the question we ask today is not whether our government is too big or too small, but whether it works. And you know, whether it helps families find jobs at a decent wage, whether they can find health care that they can afford, you know, uh, retirement that's dignified. And where the answer is yes, we intend to move forward. And where the answer is no, you know, programs will end. And so I think that as long as we, as a people, can unite around that, you know, that common theme, that common goal, just to make people's lives better, despite our partisan differences, I think that it'll be a more together America. And, and that's what I want to see. And in case you haven't noticed, if uh, the three of us 20 years from now are doing what we plan to do, you know, we're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I like this idea of unity. I hope we can, uh, we can move ahead with that. Um, Really quick for you three before I get some final words from our professors. Um, a tweet from Zara Lynn. <laughs> a yes or no, and this is a big one, so you don't answer how you feel. Uh, would you guys ever want to be president? <laughs> Absolutely. Want to be. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so the guy is, he didn't even hesitate. <laughs> All right, ladies, what do you think? I'm going to say no. I, that's <laughs> not the position of power I want to hold. Um, that's not saying I wouldn't ever want to be a part of our government or hold a position, but I just don't see myself putting myself in the position of presidency. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to answer that in a similar way that George Washington approached it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's something, public service is definitely my passion. I, that's what I think I've been given so much that I just, that's what I need to do in, with my life is give back. But I think it's a, an immense responsibility that we don't, I mean, you're serving <laughs> the entire nation mm -hmm. and it's a huge responsibility that he saw with anxiety. I mean, he came in his first sentence, this, I'm approaching this with great anxieties. This is a huge responsibility yeah. that I'm in no place to say that right now. I don't know what I'm going to be. I'm, I don't know what the situation of the country is going to be. Of course, of like. course. I know, it's a big one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no. you still probably, you know, you can go to ho go home for the weekend and think about it. But, but, um, but <laughs> just, just really quickly, really Jen, <laughs> the thing that unites the three of us up here on the stage is that we all want to help people. And despite what we're doing 20 or 30 years from now, despite what the titles in front of our names are, we will be helping people. And, mm -hmm. and that's the important thing. Yeah, I think so. Um, we're almost out of time, so I don't want to prompt any more discussion. But I want to thank everyone for coming and for everyone who tweeted and participated. It's been a really lovely discussion. And uh, I feel more informed, and I feel really hopeful for the next four years and probably the next 40. So <laughs> thanks again. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you.